Uh, before we speak to you, Mary Caulfield, it's really important for us to talk to viewers directly to say if you have issues with these, is uh, these subjects that we're discussing because they are sensitive, you can find advice and support at itv.com forward slash helplines. And also, I would urge you, because remember what Roman said, it's all about hope. There are helplines. Samaritans is 116123. Um, this is your responsibility as a government minister, Maria Caulfield. Firstly, Roman Kemp's extremely passionate plea. Schools are the place where students can go and speak, but it is not the responsibility of teachers to help with mental health issues. It's an NHS responsibility. He sent you an open letter asking for um, help in every single school, 100% coverage. Why haven't you responded yet? Good morning. Good morning. Well, he hasn't, uh, you know, it's great to see Roman um, uh, on your show. And, you know, I, I saw Roman at an event in Parliament quite recently with the charity Young Minds. Um, he didn't actually send that letter to me. He's posted it on Twitter and I have seen it uh, this week and we are responding to that, of course. Um, but what I would say is we've launched our suicide prevention strategy only this week. And the point that we want to make it to, uh, get across to, to kind of counter your, your argument is that it, this isn't just a health and social care problem. Suicide and suicide prevention is everybody's business. And what we've seen We've done our suicide prevention strategy, working with charities and organisations, working in this field, passionate about uh, reducing the suicide rates. And while we have made good progress, we, we reduced suicide by about 20% compared to two decades ago. And then COVID came, we've kind of plateaued on our pro, in our progress. We're not seeing an increase, but we're certainly not making progress in, in reducing that further. So what we want to do is to make um, suicide everyone's business, uh, because there are certain high-risk groups, young people under 35, it's a, a leading cause of death. It's also a leading cause of death in new mums and pregnant uh, women as well, which is a shocking statistic, um, and middle-aged men as well. And again, we're finding that isolated groups, people who've maybe suffered during COVID uh, with socialisation are particularly at risk. And what we're doing, particularly in schools, which is the point you're making, is, you know, the mental health support teams that we're roll running out are groundbreaking. There are very few countries in the world doing this. We are one of the first. And um, because we've seen such progress with the 35%, we've got 400 teams supporting over 3,000 schools and colleges, that's over 3 million children. We are ramping that up to go to 50%, uh, and we have got ambitions to go further. It's not just a case of funding, it's a case of finding those staff and getting them into the schools as well. Okay, can I so, put some miracle? Okay, so you've said that uh, you're hoping to get to 50%, it's an ambition to get to 100%, but as Roman says, that the effective, the metaphor is you've got two children. With 50% help, you can only help one child. I mean, that's a devastating indictment, isn't it, on the kind of coverage that you're able to provide. And there are some other devastating statistics. Um, a quarter of a million children in the UK with mental health problems have been denied help by the NHS. Some NHS trusts are failing to offer treatment to 60% of those referred by GPs. This is a Freedom of Information request. Um, responding to the House magazine, there is a postcode lottery. Average waits for a first appointment for mental health services vary by trust from 10 days to three years. How are we in a situation where a child or young person in need of mental health support has to wait three years for a referral? So there are a range of support measures, and, and I think you're referring to the CAM service uh, in, in relation to those weights. That is exactly why we're putting resources into schools up front. So children aren't waiting to get to a crisis point before they need a referral to CAMs, that we embed mental health wellbeing. And we're working with the Department for Education on this specifically, on how we uh, do, look at suicide prevention, talking about suicide, talking about mental health in the school curriculum, both in schools and colleges, but also in universities when but young Maria people Caulfield, are particularly forgive at risk. Me. If I was the mental health minister and a journalist said to me, in some parts of the country, you could wait three years for your child to receive mental health support, my reaction would be, that's shocking. I need to know which NHS trust that is. No young person should ever be waiting that long. I want to find out what's happening, what's gone wrong, and I'm going to fix it. So we do know which trusts uh, that, are, that we have, and what uh, have you longer done waiting to fix time. It? So what we're doing is trying to get in an earlier stage so that children aren't getting into the place Why where they it actually need... Why are children at that NHS trust? I don't know which one is it. So there are there is a range of uh, trusts that... So it's uh, more you know, than there's... one where you'd wait three years. 
So what we have seen over COVID is a tsunami of, of uh, children experiencing mental health issues. We are also encouraging people to come forward. So children and young people that perhaps wouldn't have come forward a few years ago because we weren't uh, there were stigmas Three and taboos years. about coming Maria forward. Maria Caulfield, I, I honestly, as a parent and a journalist, I can't understand how you can tolerate being in a department with a responsibility for mental health and ever have a situation where a young person is waiting three years for mental health support. That is an intolerable amount of time. So how we're trying to, to fix that? We know that there are waiting lists. We know that there is, a, you know, a excessive demand in some parts of the country, not not in all. Uh, but we are trying to get in that support earlier, so patients aren't having to be referred to CAMS, Children uh, Mental Health Services, but also that there are other uh, avenues to get help and support. Uh, and we've seen, for example, on our um, Every Mind Matters website, where people can self-refer for talking therapies, that we've seen just this year alone, 1.2 million people self-refer for those therapies. So we know that there's High demand for those services. So since finding out that three years was the time that some children were waiting, have you brought that down? Well, that's why we're, we, we've got a... Yes a, or no, a, have you brought that? Is it still... We have. From finding out that it was three years to today when you're talking to us on the programme, has that been brought down? So in some parts of the country, there's still a uh, long wait. So that's why we're recruiting 27,000 additional mental health workers, because it is about get, building that capacity so that we can see the amount of patients that are waiting. And in some places, we have brought that down uh, quite significantly. In other parts of the country where they're struggling to recruit staff, um, it's not been so easy. But there's a range of measures. But that is why it's so important, as Roman exactly uh, pointed out, that we have that mental health support teams in the school. So children aren't getting to that position Can where they need need referrals to CAM services. I know we're going to run out of time. Can I just take you back to your response and whether politics is failing here? And um, this is not a party point or a government point, because actually, last week in the reshuffle, Rosina Allen Khan resigned from the Labour shadow cabinet, and she says in her letter the reason why she's standing down is because Keir Starmer no longer thought being the mental health minister was a shadow cabinet position. That's why she explained she's resigning. You're the mental health minister. You don't attend the cabinet, so you aren't there either. But I've got to say, if you're a government minister and somebody like Roman Camp with his, Kemp, with his experience, writes a letter and it's on Twitter, you have civil servants, you have advisers, you have press teams, they come to you and say, look at this, and you respond. You say something publicly, you get in touch. You engage. I just don't understand why you didn't do anything to engage with Roman Kemp. It just looks to our viewers like both parties at the moment, including you, are not taking this issue seriously. Just explain to us why did you do nothing publicly when he put that letter into the public domain? So I have been meeting with bereaved families. I've been meeting with three dads walking, but for that's example. That's not answer to my question, is it? I'm asking you. I think it's I'm asking you a particular question. So Why I'm did you do nothing question. to respond to Roman Kemp? Don't tell me about other things. Tell me about that. So Why did I'm, you do nothing? Because I am meeting with families who are bereaved. We've launched our suicide strategy um, only this week, which has been welcomed by charities and organisations that I have been meeting with, with, working with, so they are part of that strategy being rolled out. It's so important to hear from people who don't get that opportunity to speak out. Bereaved fathers, bereaved mothers who've lost children to suicide. You do know suicide. you're not answering my question, don't you? Well, I, I'm answering your question. No, you're my not answering my question. My question is, is very is simple. With why who've been did you, by why did you not respond publicly to Roman Kemp's letter to you? Why didn't you? So we are in the process of responding. He only posted that letter a couple of days ago on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter uh, very much because I'm busy trying to, as you say, trying to get mental Come health on, services I've been a in minister. a better place. I know how it works. You decided well, maybe you, not to. Maybe you spent your time on Twitter. I, I certainly don't spend no, my time on Twitter. No, I had teams of people who said to me, something is important here. If I don't, I'm going to be doing an interview where I look on the back foot and I'm not engaging on something serious. And so, for both parties, that's how it looks, Maria. Well, I, you know, my preference is to meet with families that don't have a voice and who are meeting with ministers. I met with families yesterday from the Pans Pandas uh, campaigners who were children who've got uh, uh, symptoms that, exp that look like mental health illness but are actually caused by a physical illness and who are not getting uh, the help and the support that they need, often on, on long waiting lists from CAMS, when actually what they need uh, is uh, some physical clinical intervention rather than mental health services. They're the type of families up and down the country that I spend my 
day in, day out meeting because they have no other avenue or voice. The fact that we have launched our suicide prevention strategy this week, which has been welcomed by campaigners up and down the country that will target the most at risk groups, that will build on our 20% reduction in suicide rates. We have lower suicide rates than most of our European neighbours, but we want to go further than that by investing in services, by investing in early uh, intervention prevention services, so we can make that difference to young people, to new mums who are at high risk sure. of uh, okay. suicide, for well, middle aged men. I understand men. that. And, and there's a long list of things. My, my advice to you and to the Labour Party as well is that if you get a letter from Roman Kemp, who's got a very personal experience, engage publicly quickly because it's much better to show young people across the country who are listening to Roman Kemp every day on his programme that you care. And I just think you're behind the curve on this one and it's a problem. But appreciate your answers and uh, I know you've got to go. So thank you for coming on our programme. Thank you. Still to come. I just thought, sorry, just before we move on, just want to say thank you to everybody who got in touch with your own personal experiences. Um, there's a lot of talk about the consequences of poor mental health treatment and I appreciate those are very sensitive for you, so thank you for sharing them. And to Roman Kemp for being so open and public about what he's dealt with and um, for writing the letter. And do go to our website where you can get help and support and, and I do urge you as well, of course, Samaritans are there for you if you need help.